ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਤੋਂ ਦੁਆ ਜਾ ਪਰ ਬੜੀ ਛੇ ਮਾਰੀ ਹਮ ਇੱਕ ਦੁਆ ਨੂੰ ਤਰਜਮੋ ਆਪਣਾ ਫਾਇਦਾ ਮੰਗਦੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਲਈ ਇਹ ਤੇ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਇੱਕ ਵੀ ਵਸਤੂ ਤਰਫ ਜਾਣ ਜੋ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਆਪਣੀ ਅਜਾਣਤਾ ਦੇ ਕਾਰਨ ਕਿ ਆਪ ਜਾਣਤਾ ਨਾ ਹੋਵਾ ਨੇ ਕਾਰਨ ਕਈ ਵਸਤੂ ਆਪ ਨੇ ਕਹੀ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਜੇ ਜੇ ਬੋਲ ਬਰੇ ਅਮਨ ਅਜ਼ਾਨ ਤੇ ਇਤਿਹਾਰੇ ਅਜ਼ਾਨ ਦੀ ਪਹਿਲਾ ਕੁਰਾਨ ਦੀ ਇੱਕ ਆਇਤ ਤਿਲਾਵਤ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਵਲਹਮਦੁਲਿਲਾਹ ਅਲਜ਼ੀ ਲਮ ਯਤਖਿਦ ਸਾਹਿਬਤਨ ਵਲਾ ਵਲਦਾ ਔ ਲਮ ਯਕੁਨ ਲਹੂ ਸ਼ਰੀਕੁਨ ਮੁਲਕੀ ਰਮ ਯਕੁਨ ਲਹੂ ਵਲੀਤੁਨ ਮਿਨ ਅਲਜ਼ੁਲਿ ਵ ਕਬਿਰਹੂ ਤਕਬੀਰਾ ਨੇ ਤਰਤ ਹੈ ਭਾਈ ਉਹ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਪੜੋ ਹਾਲਾਂਕਿ ਇਹ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਪੜਵਾ ਨੂੰ ਕੋਈ ਮੋਕ ਨਹੀਂ ਪਰ ਕਾਰਨ ਕਿ ਆਪਣਾ ਬਾਇਓ ਨੇ ਇਮਥਾਈ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਤਤਹੀਰਾ ਅਨੇ ਤਕਬੀਰਾ ਬੜੀ ਨੂੰ ਛਿਲੋ ਰਾਗ ਇੱਕ ਜਾਤ ਨੂੰ ਸੇ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਮੰਟ ਜਿਸ ਸਲਾਤ ਕੇ ਪੜੀ ਚ ਆਪਣੇ ਪੈਗੰਬਰ ਪਰ ਜਾਨੇ ਕਿ ਜਿਬਰੀਲ ਅਮੀਨ ਹੈ ਆਇਤ ਨਾਜ਼ਲ ਤੇ ਥਈ ਨੇ ਜਿਬਰੀਲ ਅਮੀਨ ਨੂੰ ਸੰਭਾਲੀ ਚਾਦਰ ਨੇ ਨੀਚੇ ਕਿ ਜਿਹਨੇ ਆਪਣੇ ਹਦੀਸ ਕਿਸਾ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਯਾਦ ਕਰੀ ਚ ਈ ਆਇਤ ਮਾ ਕਾਰਨ ਕਿ ਪੈਗੰਬਰ ਨੇ ਅਹਲੇ ਬੈਤ ਨੀ ਤਹਾਰਤ ਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਿਕਰ ਚ ਇਤਲੇ ਆਪਰ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਪੜੀ ਚ ਇਹ ਮਾ ਲਖਿਲ ਚ ਆਇਤ ਮਾ ਇਨਮਾ ਯੁਰੀਦੁਲਾਹੁ ਲਿਯੁਦਹਿਬ ਅਨਕੁਮ ਰਿਜ਼ਸ ਅਹਲਲ ਬੈਤ ਖੁਦਾਵੰਦ ਦੇ ਕਰੀਮ ਹੈ ਇਰਾਦੋ ਕਹਿਰੋ ਚ ਕਿ ਤਮਨੇ ਅਹਲਲ ਬੈਤ ਨੇ ਪਾਕ ਰੱਖੇ ਵਯੁਤਹਿਰਕੁਮ ਤਤਹੀਰਾ ਅਨੇ ਪਾਕ ਫਰਮਾਵੇ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਤੇ ਕਿ ਜੇਵੀ ਤੇ ਪਾਕ ਕਰਵਾਣਾ ਹੱਕ ਚ ਜੇਵੀ ਤੇ ਪਾਕ ਕਰਨ ਜੋ ਹੈ ਤਾਰ ਆਪ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਪੜੀ ਜੇ ਕਾਰਨ ਕਿ ਜੀ ਤਹਾਰਤ ਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਿਕਰ ਚ ਇਨ ਅਲਾਹ ਵ ਮਲਾਇਕਤਹੁ ਯੁਸਲੂਨਾ ਅਲਨ ਨਬੀ ਕੁਰਾਨ ਮੇ ਆਇਤ ਹੈ ਅੱਲਾਹ ਪੋਤੇ ਅਨੇ ਨਾ ਮਲਾਇਕਾ ਉਹ ਨਬੀ ਉਪਰ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਮੋਕਲੇ ਛੇ ਯਾ ਅਯੂਹਲ ਲਦੀਨ ਆਮਨੂ ਸੱਲੂ ਅਲੈਹੀ ਵਸੱਲਿਮੂ ਤਸਲੀਮਾ ਖੁਦਾ ਨੂੰ ਹੁਕਮ ਦੇ ਐ ਈਮਾਨ ਲੈ ਆਉਣਾ ਰਹੋ ਤਮੇ ਪਰ ਪੈਗੰਬਰ ਉਪਰ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਮੋਕਲੋ ਅਨੇ ਸਲਾਮ ਮੋਕਲੋ ਇਤਲੇ ਆਪਰ ਸਲਾਵਾਤ ਪੜੀ ਜੇ ਕਾਂ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਤਾਂ ਹੁਕਮ ਛੇ ਪਰ ਆ ਆਇਤ ਜੇ ਪੜਾਣੀ ਅਲਹਮਦੁਲਿਲਾਹ ਅਲਜ਼ੀ ਲਮ ਯਤਖਿਰ ਸਾਹਿਬਤਨ ਵਲਾ ਵਲਦਾ ਸ਼ੁਕਰ ਛੇ ਇਹ ਖੁਦਾ ਨੂੰ ਕਿ ਜਣੇ ਨਾ ਪੋਤਾ ਨਾ ਕੋਈ ਸ਼ਰੀਕ ਲਿਦੋ ਨਾ ਇਹਨੀ ਕੋਈ ਘਰਵਾਰੀ ਛੇ ਨਾ ਕੋਈ ਦਿਕਰੋ ਵਲਮ ਯਕੁਲ ਲਹੁ ਸ਼ਰੀਕੁਨ ਫਿਲ ਮੁਲਕ ਅਨੇਨੀ ਬਾਦਸ਼ਾਹਤ ਮਾ ਇਹਨੋ ਕੋਈ ਬਾਗੀਦਾਰ ਥਿਓ ਨਤੀ ਵਕਬਿਰ ਹੂ ਤਕਬੀਰਾ ਅਨੇਨੀ ਸ਼ਾਨ ਮਾ ਤਕਬੀਰ ਪੜੋ ਸਲਵਾਤ ਨਹੀਂ तो प्यारे ना जवाब में क्या है अल्लाह अकबर इतलाज मत इतना तक तुम सांभर सो के मुअज्जिन पछि तरफ से अजान शुरू करे छे व कबिरहु तकबीरा अने पछि अजान शुरू थाय छे इन रिस्पोंस टू व्हाट ही सेज अल्लाह अकबर એટલે व दरेक चीज जगह छले रा आवे એટલે आप सलावत पढ़ो मन जे तो को कहते आप बिल्कुल अज्ञान है जाहिर में कभी અને જારે કોઈ પછી કે આ કોમને કઈ ખબર જ નથી જારે બી કોઈ રા કરે સલાવત જ પડે છે ઈ આયત છે સલાવત નો ફી સલાવત છે તહીર ની આયત છે અને સલાવત છે જે યા અયુહલ લધીન આમનુ સલ્લુ અલૈહિ વસલ્લમ તસલીમા સલાવત અલ્લાહ યા સલામ અલ્લાહ આ હો ઇસ્કી ਵਿਦਵਾਨ ਦੇ ਚ ਕਿ ਆਪ ਨੇ ਇਮਾਮ ਅਲ ਬਾਸ ਸਲਾਵਤੁਲਲਾਹ ਸਲਾਮ ਅਲੈਹ ਫਰਮਾਇਓ ਕਿ ਜਾਰੇ ਨਮਾਜ਼ ਸੁਬਹ ਪੜੀ ਜੋ ਤੁਝੇ ਦੁਆ ਪੜਵਾ ਦੇ ਚ ਇਹ ਦੁਆ ਆਪ ਨੇ ਆ ਦਿਵਸ ਕਿਮ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕਰਾਈ ਅਨ ਕਈ ਇਤ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਕਰੀ ਚ ਆਪ ਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਨਵੋ ਦਿਵਸ ਕਿ ਜੇ ਕਾਲ ਨੂੰ ਚੇ ਵੀ ਗਿਓ ਪਾਛੋ ਆਵਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਨਵੋਦੀਸ ਫਰਮਾਇਆ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਪੜੋ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੇ ਆਪੇ ਪੜੀ ਹੈ ਹਮੇਸ਼ਾ ਨਮਾਜ਼ ਬਾਅਦ
وافوض امري الى الله ان الله بصير بالعباد هم مارا بدا كام الله نے سونکی دوں چو کہ اللہ پتہ نہ بندہ ہو نہیں جو آوار ہو سوار نہ پور چھے سوار نہ پور چھے یعنی حجی نماز پڑھی نے پہلی بات آ چھے کہ ہوں مارا بدا کام ہو اللہ نے سون پوچھو وفوض امری اللہ ان اللہ بصیر بالعباد اللہ پتہ نہ بندہ ہو نہیں در ایک حالت جو آوار پچھی وفوض امری اللہ ان اللہ بصیر بالعباد پچھی سوٹ ہے یو پچھی نا جواب چھے فَوَقَاهُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِ مَا مَكَرُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ اللَّهِمِ فَوَقَاهُمُ اللَّهُ تو اللہ ہے اے لوگوں نے کہ جے لوگ کوئی انہیں سوپی دی دوسرے تمام مصیبت انہیں آفتوں تھی بچا بھی دیا بلکہ دنیا ماں تماری ورود ماں ہیلا انہیں مکر کرنا رہا ہو تھی پن تم نے بچائی وَقَاهُمُ اللَّهُ سِيَانِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ اِي تَسْبِحْ چھے پروردگار تارا سوائے کوئی خدا نہ تھی تو پاک چھو ہوں جو گنہ داروں مانو جو گنہ دار چھو سوار نفور میں ایک کے بارے حضرت یونس کے جے ایک نبی حتا جارے معاشرینا پیٹ میں خدا نہ حکم تھی گیا چھے قرآن مجیب میں خدا فرماوے چھے کہ معاشرینا پیٹ میں یونس نبی قیامت سدھی رہتے لولا ان کان من المسبحین للبث فی بطنہی الہ یوم یبعفن اگر یہ تسبیح کرتا نہ ہتے تو یہ پیٹ میں قیامت سدھی رہتے اے تسبیح کئی ہتی اے تسبیح ہتی لا الہ الا انت سبحانک انی کنت من اللہ یاد رات جو پیغمبر اکرم فرماوی انہیں آئیمہ فرماوی جائے کوئی مصیبت میں آؤ جائے قید ہوئے بلا ہوئے ایک ایوی جات میں مصیبت انہیں سنکٹ میں خدا نخواست کوئی آروت کے ہوئے کوئی دوست تو وہ دور نواز چھے خدا میں پڑھچائے اور پڑھ ساتھ آپ تو نہ ہوئے آپ نے کہیں چھے کہ دوست تو وہ دور نواز چھے خدا میں پڑھچائے اور ساتھ نہ آپ تو تم نے کہا بچے پڑھچائے اور آتنا ہوئے چھے اندکار تھا ہے تو پرچھائے ہو غائب جہرے مصیبت نو اندکار آوے چھے تو پرچھائے ہو غائب اٹھلے نجیب نا نجیب مانا تو پر تیارے جہرے کہ سوا خدا ہندے عالم نی ذات کوئی بھی جی بستو نہ ہوئے کہو لا الہ الا انت سبحانک انی کنت من الظالمین خدا ہے مصیبت نے دور کرس فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمِّ وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ ہمیں جواب دی دو خدا فرمارا ہمیں جواب دی آنے غم مطی نجاتا آنے آوج ریتے ہمیشہ مومنین نے نجات آپی چھین وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ خدا ہم نے علم آئیڈو کرے چھے آپ سوار نمپور میں آت دعا چھے وَكَذَلِكَ نُنْجِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل فانقلبوا بنعمة من الله وفضل لم تمسسهم سوء كهو مرامات خدا كافي هي السفيشت أنا بهترين وكيل مرا بدا كامو إنا هاتما تو إنو پرنامي آو سيك تمي جم لشكا ما تي سپاهيو پاچا سلامت آوي سيك إلو كنو وارو وانكو نتا تمارو وارو وانكو لم تمسا سمسو کوئی برائی در ایک ادوانی ماشا ایج دنیا ماں تھائی چھے کہ جے اللہ چاہے چھے آپ نے آپ نے بھائشہ ماں جارے کوئی مانس نہیں پر سے بہت بھائی سوچ گئے ماشا اللہ پر جانی لے جا آپ نے سوکی دو سوکی دو آپ نے کوئی مانس ماشا اللہ مارا جو جاڑو ہو چکے سو بہت اندرست چھے ماشا اللہ کوئی ساری بست جو ہی ماشا اللہ اور ما شاء اللہ اٹھلے سو ما شاء اللہ اٹھلے ایج تھائی چھے جی اللہ چاہی چھے لا حول ولا قوت الا باللہ کوئی طاقت کوئی کونکسٹ کوئی ماسٹری کوئی غلب و نتی سوائے خدا ہوں نکھائی 
ત્યાર પછી જે છે આપણે જે પડીએ છીએ વિચારવા જોઈએ માશા અલ્લાહ લા માશા અનાજ માશા અલ્લાહ વલાઉ કરી અનાજ એજ થાસે જે અલ્લાહ ચાહે છે લોકો જે ચાહે છે નહી થાય માશા અલ્લાહ લા માશા અનાજ એજ થાસે જે અલ્લાહ ચાહે છે જે લોકો ચાહે છે નહી થાય માશા અલ્લાહ એજ થાસે જે અલ્લાહ ચાહે છે વલાઉ કરી અનાજ અગર જે લોકો ના ચાહતા even if people hate it that will happen which allah wants get low confidence musliman na dil ma che ke sawar na por ma musalla upar poda na khuda sathe guftagu karto ke che ma sha allah wa in kari annas loko bhega tai ne maro virodh kare ke aa rozi tha sudhi na pahunche khuda unne kareem agar chahe che pahunche aa khubi tha sudhi na pahunche khuda unne kareem chahe che રોજી દેવા કાફી છે મારા માટે ઈ કે જે મારા માટે સફિશિયન્ટ અને કાફી છે હસબી મન લમ યઝક મારા માટે એ કાફી છે જે હંમેશાથી સફિશિયન્ટ અને એડિક્વેટ અને કાફી રહ્યો છે હસબી મન લમ યઝલ હસબી હસબી મન કાન મુઝ કુનતુ લમ યઝલ હસબી મારા માટે એ ખુદા કાફી છે કે જાતિ હું જન્મ્યો ત્યાંથી કાફી રહ્યો છે ધેટ હુ હેઝ બીન લુકિંગ આફ્ટર મી સિન્સ આઈ વોઝ બોર્ન હેઝ રિમેન સફિશિયન્ટ વિલ એવર રિમેન સોંપી <laughs> 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 બાંધો નહી તો ઊંટ રખડતો ફરે નથી <laughs> રોજી માં તંગી દેખાય કામકાજ માં જરાક મંદી દેખાય એમ લાગે કે કમાણી જરાક ઓછી થઈ છે અથવા ઘટતી જાય છે મુસલમાન માટે ખુદા કરીમે કેવી રીતે ઇન્તઝામ કર્યું છે કે એનો દિવસ કેમ ઉગે છે અને પૂછતાની સાથે સવાર
Now, we will begin with a slight digression from that subject. As I said earlier, we are going to discuss our faith in some death. For the benefit of our children, our young men, those who might understand English better, and even for our ladies, I am sorry, and I apologize to those elders and ladies who might not be able to understand English. I hope somebody at home who will make an effort to translate and explain. But there are certain concepts and certain thoughts which can be better explained in English, and it, it can be better understood. The first thing in Islam which is uh, fundamental, is belief in one God, which we have heard from the day we were admitted to a mother's. When our Muallim said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad And we know that, and we hear it quite often. But have we ever given a thought as to what we say when we say, there is no God but Allah? <clears throat> Remember, that the unity of God in Islam is an absolute unity. The word used is Ulhu Allahu Ahad, O Prophet. Tell them that Allah is one. That is the translation you'll find in every Quran that you pick up. But it's so difficult sometimes to render the Arabic word into English. Because in Arabic, one is Wahid and not Ahad. Most of us who are acquainted with elementary Arabic, we know that. Wahid means one. And God did not say, Qul huwallahu Wahid. God has said, Qul huwallahu Ahad. After every Wahid, there is Ithnain, which means two. But in Arabic, after Ahad, there is no Ithnain. So that is the difference. When you say Ahad, then there is no two. While if you say Wahid, then there is the name. So that means when God said, Qul Allahu Ahad, O Prophet, tell them that Allah is Ahad, what he meant was that it is an absolute unity. Therefore Imam Ali Islam says in Najul Balagha, that he is one, but not by concept of number. Because if it is a concept of number, then it must be two after one. Or it must be even less, it can be half. Because it is an absolute unity. Therefore, it must be understood that. <coughs> Secondly, Imam Jabal Sadiq al Islam said, oh, <laughs> The human mind has a tendency of thinking of everything which it has not seen and imagining it. And the imagination cannot go beyond what one can imagine. For example, he said, an ant. If an ant were asked, what does it think about God? It might tell you that it crawls, God crawls. And it has got so many feet as the ant itself has. Because that is what the ant can think and imagine. That the existence must be of that type. Human beings, when they imagined about Allah, about God, they always thought that he had the same limbs, hand, face, and all that. Because that was the limit to which human imagination could go. But anything that comes into an idea is not God. This is the philosophy of Islamic divinity. Anything that comes and forms an idea is not God. So now when we say Allahu Akbar, God is greater. In English, for every adjective that we use, it is either in its original form or it is comparative or it is superlative. When we say it is good, then we say it is better, and then 
we proceed to say it is the best. And so, Kabir and Akbar, Kabir is big and Akbar is bigger or greater. When there is a comparative degree in adjective, there must be something with which it is compared. And if you say that this is darker, you will have to show darker than what? If you say this is fairer, then you have to say fairer than what? If you say it is stronger, naturally you have imagined something which is weaker and this is stronger. Now if you say God is greater, greater than what? The question will arise. Allah greater than what? Therefore, Imam Jafar Sadiq was asked this question when he conducted the classes and created philosophers and thinkers out of Muslims. The Muslims started asking, Yabna Rasulillah, O son of the Prophet, God is greater, greater than what? And he said, Allahu Akbar min an Yusuf. He is greater than any description. That is the philosophy, guy. He is greater than any description. So there can be nothing which can be described. And actually the meaning is that he is the greatest. Now, with this thinking, remember that God is one for creation. God is one for all that acts which appear on earth and everywhere in the creation. God is one for worship. He is not only one for worshipping, he is the sole creator. He is the omnipotent one who has the power absolute and alone. So when we say Tawheed, we mean Tawheed fil khalq, Tawheed bil fi'l and Tawheed fil ibadah. One for ibadah, one for creation and one for all the acts which we see. And therefore, when we say La ilaha illallah, this is the meaning of what happened. When the Prophet first said, La ilaha illallah, what happened? Let us describe and let us study the reaction of the people who were there. Did they accept it? They did not. And those who did not, why did they reject it? They rejected it because the concept of Tawheed, La ilaha illallah, was not only a formula, it was a rebel. It was a revolution. When a man does not believe in one God and has got so many deities and gods, then his loyalties are divided. And so is the loyalty of every tribe to which a particular God belongs. And when there is one universal concept, Allah alone and none, all the values which they had created and established within the society shattered. There was a God who was supposed to be for, for the landlords. There was a God who was supposed to be for the tenants. There was a God who was supposed to be for the masters. And there was a God who was supposed to be for the slaves. When the Prophet said, La ilaha illallah, it meant that now there's only one Allah for the slaves and for the masters, for example, and for the landlords and for the tenants, for the soldiers for the rulers and for the ruled, for the prophet himself. So the difference and distinction that was there when there were so many deities collapsed. And therefore there was created a society with new values and this was a revolution and they did not want this challenge to come up. With one formula of la ilaha illallah, the whole setup crashed and that fire, that's why it was a revolution. And when we accept La ilaha illallah, it is a revolution. <coughs> we don't understand it. It's different, quite different. The concept of Tawheed in Islam is different. Every religion, Christianity will tell you God is one. Hinduism will tell you God is one. Buddhism will tell you God is one, if at all they believe in God. And Judaism will tell you God is one. But there's a difference. A difference in Islam is absolute unity. No one to share that Godhead, not even the Prophet. When the Prophet was dying, he said, look, I tell you that please do not worship my grave. 
Do not come to my grave to worship it. Come for salam, don't come for worshiping it. Because I am just but a servant of Allah. And we say this in namaz. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. I give witness that there isn't any God but Allah, no partners to him. Wa ashhadu anna, and I give witness, Muhammadan, Muhammad, abduhu, his servant, wa rasuluhu, his messenger. No deity, no Godhead. There's a difference, a vast difference. Once Imam Rada Islam was sitting in the court of Mamun, and a Christian priest who was there brought by Mamun just for a debate and and polemic, asked Imam Rada a very pertinent question. He said, Do you believe in Isa? Imam Rada said, Yes, we do. A Muslim must believe in all prophets. He said, but there's a difference. Why don't you believe in him as son of God? A pious man. Born of mother without father. Quran says, born of Maryam without father. So Imam Radha Islam said, I do believe that Isa was a very pious and virtuous man. That he was born of Hazrat Maryam without father. And that was the miracle which Allah Himself worked. But there is one thing which I don't like about Isa. <coughs> Imam Radha says this. It's a very delicate situation. Imam Radha said, one thing I don't like about Isa. And the priest said, what is that? What you don't like about him? He said, he used to sometimes be lazy about his prayers. And that priest said, Ya Abna Rasulillah, O son of Islamic Prophet, you are telling me that Isa was lazy about his prayers? The man who prayed day in and day out? Sometimes he went to Sajda for hours, and you are telling me that he was lazy? How could you get a better worshipper? Imam Raza al-Islam immediately said, Who was he worshipping? Who was he worshipping? Do you understand the implication of what Imam Rada al-Islam brought about? By just saying that he worshipped less and he was lazier, the reaction was that no, he worshipped most. So Imam Rada al-Islam turned back and said, who was he worshipping? If he was himself a part of Godhead, there was no need for worshipping. But the very fact that you say he worshipped and worshipped most proves that he was not God, he was but a servant. There is something else which has got to be worshipped. In Islam, gentlemen, and my sisters and mother who, mothers who are there listening, in Islam, God is not personal. He's not a human being like us sitting. He doesn't have any limbs. He does not have these things which we envisage. And when we talk about his attributes and qualities, there is a difference between the qualities and attributes we possess and that which he possesses. Do not consider him as a person. There is no personal God. This is Ahl Bayt Tawheed I am just reading. Please don't bring arguments about what Sahih Bukhari says because I am not concerned with the Tawheed of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah. It is totally different. I am talking of that Tawheed which has come from Ahlul Bayt, right from Ali ibn Abi Talib al -Islam, up to Imam Isa al oh, 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 oh. I am not talking about Ahlul Sunnah because if you bring Sayyid Bukhari, you will find so many things in it. There are so many things. And if you bring other books of Ahlul Sunnah, I can show you what they write. And it is worse than being an idol worshipper, than being a believer of Tawheed in that way where they say that God is so old, is so old, that his beards have overgrown, that when he sits on Arsh, he is so fat, he is so fat, that he is, his body sometimes is beyond the chair, by four fingers hanging. And the Arsh itself says, I'll break just now because of his weight. It's just like me sitting on this member. 
if it was not strong enough, it would start speaking. It would start giving in. <coughs> and they have just all ahadith in their books, which we do not believe in. Because in Najibul the first khutbah is Imam Ali says, alayhi salam, whoever, listen to this, whoever points towards him, <coughs> confines him. What a wonderful thing Imam Ali has said about God. Whoever points towards him, confines him. If I point towards you, what does it mean? It means you are there, limited to a space which you are occupying. If I finger, point a finger at you, it means you are there. You are there, you are there. You point a finger at me, I am there. Whoever points a finger at him, confines him, that means sets a limit to him. And there is no limit. And whoever sets a limit to him, counts him, and he cannot be counted. This is what Imam Ali said. Man ashara ilayhi faqad hadda, wa man haddahu faqad adda. Whoever points towards him, sets a limit to him. And whoever sets a limit to him, has counted him, and he is not to be counted. And there is no limit. This is the concept of absolute pure tawheed of Islam according to <coughs> Ahlul Bayt. There cannot be anything better than this. And therefore I'm talking purely on that level. I'm talking on the level of what Muslims, other scholars have written. Talking of Shia, Ahlul Bayt. This concept of Allah makes us rise higher and higher and higher. We believe in that one absolute unity which created us and women. Now, I would not like to be cumbersome, but I feel that there are youngsters here, young people here, who are fairly educated. Some of them are better educated than I am. Please don't consider me to be a very highly educated man. I am just a layman. And if you are interested to know, I have failed my Cambridge examination. Therefore, I lay no pretense to any attainment or achievement. But listen to me. And you can verify this with any of your sources, and you will understand this. When I studied a theory which was advanced by Einstein as early as 1905, <coughs> the beginning of it, when we read about those things in our school days, among the many things he said, there was one thing which he insisted upon, emphasized, for laymen like us to understand. It's very difficult to understand his theory if you are not a physicist. He said, light travels at the speed of 186,000 miles per second. Now that's understood and it's accepted. And he said in his book that listen to the words which he has written and you can check. Whatever object on this earth gets that velocity and speed which is the speed of light if anything is can be conceived which can travel at the speed of light it will exist but it will not be seen yes anything that assumes the velocity of light if it is half the velocity of light it will reduce by half in size and he says that if you were to travel together with a food ruler to measure it, you will find it exactly, if it is a, suppose an object traveling in space is one foot long, if it assumes half the speed of light, he says it will be seen as half. But if you put a foot ruler together traveling with it, you will find it will be to show a foot. But the foot ruler itself has been reduced to half. And he says, if that speed increases and the velocity comes to that of light itself, 
at 186,000 miles per second, it will cease to be seen, but it will exist. What I say there is this, that Khuda on the Kareem in Quran Majid says, Allahu Nuru Samawati wal Earth. Allah is light of the heavens and earth. If an ordinary object traveling at that velocity can exist without being seen, and science is prepared to believe in that, why can't we believe in him who creates light and is not seen? It cannot be seen. It isn't an object to be seen. There is no question of seeing. Allah will not come to shake hands with us on the day of judgment and to congratulate us before we enter heaven. That will not happen. It is not that thing. If we can understand our Allah this way, then we come to a particular stage when we pray, nothing should be there before us. None. We are in this, Musaf, in this small temporary member. There is no other place, otherwise I would have requested even these alums to be removed when we are playing. No photographs. And the mosque or the place where you pray has got to be as simple as possible. No distraction as far as inner part of the sense. Because you are there standing before an absolute unity. And this is where it was difficult. That Imam was asked, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, it's so difficult to worship an abstract God. You know abstract something. Can't be touched, can't be seen, can't be felt, can't be heard. Intangible, abstract unity. We are used to idols keeping murti and buddh before us. We look at it and then we say, we are used to so many things. And you have now brought us to a point where we stand on Musalla, we can't see him. And that was a time when Imam said that the beginning of the feeling about that Allah who actually is your creator is not that you can't see him or that you can see him. No. The beginning is that you realize that he sees you while you don't see. The feeling of presence, that he is present. And it is for this reason that, that Islam, Tawheed in Islam, is a wonderful concept. Next time, inshallah, when I see it, I will translate certain sentences of Ali ibn Abi Talib Salawatullah. It will serve two purposes. One, the purpose will be to show that as early as in those days, the concept explained and enunciated by Imam Ali alayhi salam could not be improved upon by the various thinkers who came out. Perhaps it was better, always better. That is one. Second thing, it will give a sense of satisfaction to us that the faith about Allah in Islam, according to Ahlul Bayt, is in its purest form. There is nothing better. And finally, we will be proud of that Tawheed in which we believe. And we can see some subtle changes in our living if we recognize that. Gentlemen, to recognize something is something else. To realize something is something else. You know, here is a candle and there is a flame. Will any one of us dispute that the flame will burn? None. Everybody knows. Every one of us has recognized that fire burns. But unless you place a finger in that flame and get yourself scorched and burnt, 
you will not realize what burning is. Will it? So there is a degree, a degree of recognition and a degree of a realization. Tawheed, recognized by all of us, not yet realized. Let us come to that stage where we realize that we believe in one God and what are the implications, applications and effects upon upon our life. I have received certain questions from ladies and uh, today I give preference to the ladies because in this country ladies always come first. <laughs> <laughs> there is a very interesting question and this shows as to sometimes what is being told or said is not correct. I don't blame anyone but there is one thing is the Jamaat President Secretary and all my brothers, my elders and mothers and sisters, please remember one thing, that fiqah is not everybody's cup of tea. Masail, every mullah or mullah that comes is not acquainted and conversant with fiqah. You are asking questions to mullahima or mullah who reads a majlis about fiqh. First ask her or him as whether she knows or he knows fiqh or not. If he or she does not know fiqh, she will tell you or he will tell you that that is not my line. My line is just to read majlis and serve as other. This Muhtarama lady says, Ma hai muharram ni majalis ma ek jagya evaiz thai the sawab in namaz padi me sui jaye to namaz baatil thai jaye to te barabar che ke kem te no jawab aapshu Now, we all know that namaz baatil thai thai nothing He or she has prayed after having prayed if she goes to sleep Namaz does not become baatil whether it is namaz is subu or namaz is subu or asal what becomes baatil is the wudu if you have slept but you have prayed, your namaz is sahih. Of course, if you sleep while you are still praying, <laughs> then your namaz is bad. And then, although I will touch that subject when I come to that, inshallah, I do fiqh on Sunday morning, and those who are interested, inshallah, will come to know about that. Then, there is a lady who has asked me several questions which will come in the course of time. But there's one interesting question here which I cannot leave unanswered. She says, The Barma Imam Nima Nazis Khatun, Italy Nya Badshah Nidikriyata, the Kevi the Agyarma Imam Ali Islam had the Shadi the Kogeri. Now this I would like to keep and answer later on, but I must answer this, that she was not an Italian, that she was not a daughter of an Italian family, as is normally understood. I mean, she has written this, it isn't her, her uh, uh, mystery. This has been said by many people. In history, it is written that she was a daughter of a king of Rome. And what people have translated room is wrong. Wrong is not room. In Quran, if you remember, there is a surah, which is known as Surah al rum which we recite on the nights of Qadr, Shabi Qadr. That is not the surah of wrong. <laughs> and there is an ayah in Quran which says, Alif la mim ghulibati room, in the same surah. That room is not wrong. Now what is room? Room in those days was what is today known as Byzantine Empire, which consisted of Turkey, upper parts of Iraq, which was known in those days as Mesopotamia. Those parts were known as room, and Imam's mother, Najis Khatun, is from that part and not from Rome, and therefore 
she did not come from Italy. She came from the Middle East country. And then, there are so many very interesting questions, which of course will take time, and I will come as a man, but there's one which I can't leave unanswered, and that is about Mr. maybe Johnson or Jensen, in his book Militant Islam, says that Hazrat Muhammad was an illiterate, and that is why he did not write the Quran, but he let it be heard. What arguments do we have in documentary? Well, the question is whether he was illiterate or not. And if at all he was or he was not, how was Quran revealed? Well, the question is this: that although ulama are divided about this, just listen to one ayah and one historical event, and inshallah everything will be solved. In Surah Juma, which we read in Namaz Juma, the second ayah, which you can refer, inshallah, when you go home. God says, "Who will be bathed of the Ummiyin and Rasul of Him?" He, Allah, is one who sent the Prophet or the Messenger unto them from among themselves, from the people who stay in Ummul Qura, that is Mecca. Yatlu alayhi ma yati. He recites, reveals up to them the signs of Allah. Wa yuzakkihim, purifies them. وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ Teaches them the book and the wisdom. Now, how can an illiterate man do this? How can a person who is supposed to be illiterate teach wisdom, teach kitab? That is one. Second thing is this, that the Prophet did not, in fact, Right during his life, for one reason, <clears throat> he never wrote because people never saw him write. If they had seen him write, they would have argued that we know that he can write, and this Quran is his writing. When the Prophet started reciting Quran in Majid, the first argument which went in his favor was. That for the last 40 years we haven't seen Muhammad write. He does not write, and he is but a man of letters. And these words that we hear from him is far superior to what we ourselves, after being educated and being men of letters, cannot equal. And Quran has put forward this argument as well. He says, "Oh Prophet, tell them, have they ever seen me write anything?" So the very fact that he refrained from writing was because he did not want that argument to go to say that he knows to write and therefore he has written this. Otherwise, he knew when the Sula of Hudaybiyah was transacted on eighth Hijri, Fath Makkah, when Makkah was conquered, Imam Ali was sitting next to the Prophet, and there was a truce. And in that truce, the Prophet asked Imam Ali to write down the terms, and Imam Ali Islam wrote, "This is a truce uh, between Muhammad Rasulullah and the leaders of Makkah." Hada ma salah bihi Muhammadun Rasulullah. This is the, the terms upon which Muhammad Rasulullah has entered the truce. When the opponents read this, they said, "Ali, if we had agreed that he's Rasulullah, then what was the bond of contention? Where was the difference? If we had agreed that he's Rasulullah, then there's no question of truce. Remove that Rasulullah." Write his father's name, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So Imam Ali Islam 
kept quiet. And the Prophet looked at Imam Ali and said, Spark it off. And like Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Imam Ali Islam then said, He said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, your order is an order. But my hand cannot strike off Rasulullah after having uh, written it once. If you will pardon me and forgive me. And the Prophet took the paper in his hand. Struck off Rasulullah. Struck off Rasulullah. Did not write Ibn Abdullah. Just struck off Rasulullah. And it was Muhammad as it is. And then he said, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who are Muhammad ibn Rasulullah? Muhammad son of Abdullah is the same as Muhammad the Prophet. Now I ask, he was illiterate. How did he read? He should have told the people, come and show me where is Rasulullah. And in some books where people wanted to prove still that the Prophet was illiterate, they have written that the Prophet asked for the paper where Rasulullah was written. He did not know how to read, so he held the paper upside down. And somebody else came and said, Rasulullah, it is not this way, it is this way. These are the fabrications which went to prove that the Prophet was illiterate. The Prophet refrained from writing for the sake of the proof to be established that he had not written anything earlier than that and that the book was written. Otherwise, he was not illiterate. He was the one who taught us. And he is the one who taught Imam Ali. And can we forget that famous hadith, which says, Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is its door. Where is that knowledge if he was illiterate? So we must try to understand that this is a tradition which has been reported by all. Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah and the Sharia repeated that the Prophet said two ways. One, he said, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Ali Babuha. I'm city of knowledge and Ali is its door. And the second time he said, Ana Madinatul Hikmah wa Ali Babuha. I'm the city of wisdom and Ali is its door. Wa man arad al Madinata fal yati bil Bab. And whoever wants to enter in the city must come through the door. And this is what it is. I'm going to treasure this and answer some very important questions later on. It's 10 o'clock. People have started yawning. And I would not like to continue any further, except saying, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If there's any question about fiqh or anything, which has some urgent need for clarification, please let us have five minutes, you can ask. If there's nothing that urgent, then you can be kept for the next. But if there's something about ibadah, about tahar, or about aqidah, which you think must be clarified, I'm here for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Otherwise, on Saturday morning, it is the history of Ambiya, up to the end, inshallah. And on Sunday morning, it is fiqh. Up to ahkam al-mayyid, inshallah.